If someone challenged you to come up with your 100 best images, how difficult would that be? That's the subject of this video. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 144 of Understanding Darktable. On my photography podcast, Shutters Inc., about three episodes ago, Glenn threw out this idea of producing a physical printed book of your 100 best images. And it really resonated with me at the time. And I said to him, I'm going to do that. And he went, really? And I went, yeah, I am. I really like that idea. And then, you know, maybe once every five years you redo it and you you know, you either come up with another 100 images or maybe if you want to take the easy way out, you just discard the weakest ones and you put in some new ones that are... Anyway, whatever. So I have been giving this some thought and over the last couple of episodes of the podcast as they've gone by, he's asked me, well, what have you been up to? And I've gone, oh, I'm processing my images for the for my top 100 project. And he's like, you're really doing it? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So, I thought I would start creating videos of these images as I'm reprocessing them. And as I've said in the past, I'm at a point now where I'm no longer throwing away the old edits. I want to keep the old XMP files so that over time I can see how my approach to processing raw files has hopefully improved. <laughs> Certainly working my way through these images so far, I have cringed when I've looked back at some of my earlier edits. Uh, and at the moment, what I've got here is a collection of 102 different images. So there's a couple that need to go, but that's fine. And I'm so far, I'm up to this image here, which is what, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yep. So I've processed 27 images so far. And the next image I'm going to process is this one here. Now, what I've been doing is going into the duplicate manager, marking my original edit as original because I don't recall what version of Darktable I was on when I processed that, and then creating a duplicate completely reset to the original raw file and nothing else, and naming it with the current version of Darktable that I'm on. That way, over time, I can see, you know, if I do revisit an image to re-edit it, I can see what I've done in the past. So, this was a weekend trip out to a farm in the middle of New South Wales with Tegan, uh, with a bunch of other photographers. It was a trip that I'd organised, and this is going to be the next one that I process. So... I'm going to start with the crop. I'm going to get that 16 by 9 thing happening again. And I know you could probably say, well, why are you still doing 16 by 9 if these are going to be printed? It's not like they're, you yeah, know, they don't have to be 16 by 9 for the photo book. They don't, but I kind of like the aspect ratio. Although there's something to be said for not cropping this because I then get a little bit... Actually, I think I would want to get rid of that broken area up there. So maybe what I will do is I'll go for a freehand crop and that way I can get the top of the door into the frame, but get rid of that bit at the top and I want to, maybe I want to keep a little bit more of the dirt there in front of her boot. So yeah, maybe we'll go with something like that. Now you can see that originally I processed this as a black and white and I still think I want to go in that direction. First things first, I want to get the mid-tone exposure to somewhere where I feel like it should be, which I think is somewhere about there. 1.3 stops above where I shot it. Fair enough. We will go to color calibration. I'll let the module do its thing. And let's just start with roughly 30% of all channels and just see what that balance is looking like. Kind of like it with a little bit more of the red channel in it. And that's looking pretty good so far. And if we normalize channels, that will then bring this ratio back as far as it needs to, or lift it as far as it needs to, so that the collective values add up to 1.000. Next up, uh, I probably want to vignette it a little bit 
but I'm not going to use the vignette. I'm actually going to use a couple of graduated density filters and I'm going to draw them this way and I'll crank up the hardness so that I can see where it's actually doing its thing. I'm going to do something like that to just darken down one side and we'll actually name that right. And it's just occurred to me I don't have Keymon running, my apologies. And now we will go with a new instance, which we will call left. And then we can do the same thing over here. Increase the hardness, increase the intensity a little bit, something like that. So if we now go back before those, that's where we were. This is where we're at now. Yeah, I like that because that really sort of highlights Tegan in the center of the shot. I probably want to do a bit of a split tone look. I tend to like that for monochrome images. For that, I'll probably go to the Color Balance RGB four ways tab. And for the shadows, I think I'm going to stick with a, a sort of a reddish brown tint to give it a, a bit of a, a sepia type of look. And then for the highlights, I'll probably go up into the yellow section of the spectrum. Luminance, yeah, let's just lift that up a little bit. And the luminance for the shadows, maybe just a little bit negative. And that is our split tone. Now the histogram would suggest that there's still some room to push this further. Let's go tone equalizer, shall we? And we'll jump over to the masking tab and we will spread out our masked range here a little bit. That's looking better. Okay, so now we've got our tonal range spread across this advanced graph. We can see that the majority of the highlights are sitting here around minus two, so we can probably push all of this up a little bit. It's really getting bright. I don't think I want to push that any further than that. I feel like I'm going to lose detail, you know, in the skin tones, which I don't want to do. Actually, just going to bring it back a little bit. All right. In terms of tone mapping, I'm defaulting to Filmic RGB. So we'll just let it do its thing. And there you go. It's pushed the highlights out without it looking too blown out here. So uh, I'm happy with that. Uh, and I'm actually not going to tweak that any further. I'm just going to leave Filmic to do its thing because it generally does a pretty good job. For those who are interested to see what the difference would be like between Filmic and Sigmoid, let's set this to a uniform blend, but we'll bring it back to a 0%. So that way, Filmic remains active in terms of the module, but it's actually not having an impact. And now we can go and grab Sigmoid. So we'll turn on Sigmoid. We'll try and skew this a little bit for our highlights. Yeah, see, I'm not loving that at all. That's really blown out the highlights in an unpleasant way. Even if I bring that back, Tegan just looks overcooked for my liking. So again, we'll set this to minus 100 and then we'll bring Filmic back into the mix. See, there's, there's Sigmoid. There's Filmic. Yeah, I much prefer Filmic, to be honest. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of Sigmoid. No longer need that. Compress my history stack. Sometimes with skin, I, like particularly females, I will put a blur on the skin. And the way I do that is I will go to the blurs module, crank it up to something that gives us a bit of... That's obviously too great a blur, somewhere about there. Now this is gonna look like stupid overkill to begin with, but just bear with me here. So I'm gonna go with a brush, and what I want to do is simply draw through any areas where there is just skin tone. I don't wanna hit any edges or anywhere where there's a, a bit of contrast. I'm just gonna bring that radius down a little bit further because it was just a little bit too much and I'm still not loving that path. So I'm just gonna start all over again. So I'm going to avoid that part on the right side of her knee there where there's that shadow because I don't want to put the blur across anything where there's an edge. 
that will do for now. Now we can do the other leg. And again, I'm staying away from high contrast areas. Like I said, this looks absolutely terrible at the moment. Just bear with me here. And what I really should have been doing was control clicking on the path so that I didn't have to keep on reselecting the tool. Now, in terms of a face, I don't know if we're actually going to need to do anything. We probably don't. And she's actually a little bit soft. My focus was actually not as good as I thought it was. But you know what? I'm just going to, just to continue the process, I will just add a little bit of blur to her skin. And we are going to sharpen her face up so that we... Uh, at least make it look like we had good focus at the time of capture, even if we didn't. All right, so I said that this was going to look terrible to begin with. What I'm going to do now is pull that opacity right back to zero. I'm just going to zoom in on her leg here, and that'll give us a reasonable idea of how this blur is looking, and just slowly increase the, the level. I think somewhere about 40% is probably as far as I would want to push that. Now, in terms of sharpness, like I said, it's obvious when I've zoomed in on her face that I really didn't have this uh, focused as well as I thought. Mind you, I am at 195%. If I was to go back out to 100%, we can see it's, it's not awful. Uh, but when you zoom in, you can see that I didn't actually have great focus on the eyes. So for that, I will go to the, uh, not tone equalizer, sorry, contrast equalizer was what I wanted, and go to the Luma tab. Now, think about sharpness. What we want to do is sharpen where there is contrast. And where there is contrast, there is naturally going to be fine detail. And if you look at the graph, it says coarse on the left, fine on the right. If you want to use this for sharpening, you're really just going to lift up the right-hand side of the graph. As you can see, that has sharpened this image a lot and it looks extreme. But again, what we're going to do is go drawn and parametric. I'm going to go with a drawn mask and I'll probably include the hat because that, you know, is sort of at that point where I want things to be in focus. And I'll include her hair, but I'll try and exclude some of the wood just here. And then the parametric side of this, I actually want to go with the luminosity channel and simply bring it back to the darker pixels because it's the detail around the eyes, the eyebrow, and the detail around the edge of her face. So if we have a look at this mask, that's not too bad. Might just bring in a little bit more. That kind of works if we turn off contrast equalizer that's without that's with that's helped a little bit it's not brilliant uh but i think that's partly due to the fact that i just didn't nail the focus at the time that i took the image i think that's going to do it now the whole point of this hundred best images was predicated on the idea that you know so often we go out and we shoot and we never print these images you know, some of the stuff that's from my holidays with the family, they've been printed because I always produce a photo book of our holidays. But a lot of these things where I've worked with models on, you know, shoots like this one, that stuff never gets printed. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing that stuff printed. But it was based on this idea that, you know, God forbid you get hit by a bus tomorrow. What is there left to represent the work that you shot that you were happy with. If it never got printed, if it was just sitting on a hard drive somewhere, who in your family is going to know where to find those images? And, and would they bother to go looking? So what I am going to do is, as I work my way through the remainder of these images, is create a video of me processing all of these images. But probably only one in every five will actually end up on the YouTube channel. The rest will be available for the patrons on tiers three and four. Uh, I hope this has been useful. And I think the methods that I take with my processing, you will see as we work our way through these videos, 
It differs depending on the subject matter. Oh, just on how I collated these images. Whenever I have an image that I think, yeah, I'm happy to use that as wallpaper on my computer monitor, what I do is I will go into the metadata editor here and I will add the description wallpaper. And so then over here in the collections module, I can search for wallpaper and there are the images that are in my wallpaper collection. Now, at the moment, you can see that there are a lot of duplicates in there, and that's because of the work I've been doing on this top 100 project. But what I did was I used my wallpaper collection as a starting point. I selected all the images by going control A, and I then created a tag called top 100. And I added that tag to all of those images. And then as I'm processing these images, obviously I'm creating a duplicate XMP because I want to keep my original edit. And then what I do is I remove the top 100 tag from the original edit and only leave it in the new edit. So then my collection here has all of the new edits of the images that I've processed so far, plus the images that I'm yet to get to. So that's it so far. And that's where we're going with this project. I'm not rushing it. I'm going to take my time to go through and process all of these images. And when it's done, I'm going to get a photo book printed uh, with all of these images, which I'm looking forward to. All right, I'll leave it there. Questions, comments, sing out down below. I'll catch you in the next one.